Hello fellow Unreal Engine artists, designers and developers and welcome back to the Landscape Material series. So today's episode is going to be slightly different. We've done 12 tutorials so far and quite a few questions have been raised on each topic. So what I thought I would do is go through your comments and look at the questions and give you some answers. So this is an intermission to the regular programming but I uh, think you might find it quite useful to uh, see what people have been having problems with, what they've been asking questions about, and what the replies are. So let's start with the first one. This is from No Comment Games, and they ask, does it matter that the texture being used, the forest path, has a different X and Y size, 1K by 2K, and is not square? So this was during our tiling episode, and my reply was that it was not really an issue, although it isn't reflecting reality. So let's look at how you find out what each of these texture sizes should be. And then we'll talk about what we could and should do about it. So if you go into um, Fab and we'll go into our library and look at the texture. So let's look at this rock cliff texture, for example. If you look at the description in each texture, it tells you, or at least the Quixel ones do, it tells you what the scan area was. So for this rock cliff, it was a one by one meter scan area. And that means that our tiling should be a tiling of one to one with the landscape, which also has a one meter coordinate system. Uh, but that's only if you want it in reality. Our choice doesn't have to reflect reality. We can choose based on artistically how we want it to look. Let's look at another one. If we go into the mossy grass, that scan area is two by two meters. So again, to reflect that absolutely accurately, we would change the tiling factor here to two for our near textures. And finally, let's look at the forest path. This was the one that No Comment Games mentioned was an issue. And you can see it's not a square scan area. It's one by two meter. So if you look on the landscape, this forest path, which is the texture we put on this valley is not accurate. It's being stretched in one of those directions because we're treating it as a square texture. Um, so is there anything we can do about it? Well, yes, we can do, we can change the tiling logic. And in fact, at the moment, if you look at the material instance, we've got a single global parameter for the near and far tiling sizes. So that same tiling size is applied to every texture in every layer. But as you just saw, the cliff was different to the grass. The grass is different to the forest path. So in a future episode, I'll show you how you can have tiling factors on each layer. And while we're there, we'll also put an aspect ratio parameter in as well so that we can fix textures that aren't square. So stay tuned for that one. And let's move on to the next question. OK, in this comment, L Villanoraw2, if I can say that correctly, said in Unreal Engine version 5.3, I can't seem to collapse nodes to a material function. And there were other comments as well, particularly people using the new Unreal 5.5 that was just released, saying that certain things didn't work properly. Now, um, certainly with Unreal 5.5, the reason I didn't use that in these tutorials is it's only just been released. I have heard reports that there are still bugs, so I didn't want to go down that route. Um, I did mention at the start of the series that I was using 5.4 and to stick with that for maximum compatibility. But everything I'm showing should work with Unreal Engine 5, pretty much every release, with the exception maybe of the PCG graph, which didn't really stabilize until 5.4. Trio risk, you can see at the comment at the bottom here, suggested adding 5.4 in the title of my videos. And that's probably a good idea for the moment. So I'll go and change those and uh, make sure everybody knows when they click on the video, it's for Unreal Engine 5.4. And then if 5.5 stabilizes or future releases stabilize, and I can show that everything works properly, I may change the titles to say Unreal Engine 5.4 or above. Damien Ramirez says that color variation really needs to go before the snow layer. So when we were doing our color mask, 
I put it at the end of all the layers. And of course, it can go wherever you want. But yes, it probably makes sense. Snow on the top of mountains is usually pretty pure. So let's uh, look at the issue and actually we'll quickly resolve it if you want to do that. So let's put our snow, let's turn our snow noise down to zero. So we've got complete snowy top to that mountain. And let's bump up our color variation intensity to one and our contrast to one. Okay, so you can see we're overdoing it here, but you can see now that the color variation is on the snow as well. So if you go to the uh, master material, this is where we did the color variation. So we did it after blending all our layers, including the snow. So if we want it before the snow, we just need to move this back a little bit. So let's do that. Let's take those color variation nodes. Let's just detach them temporarily. And I'll put it up here. And what I want to do is I want it coming out of this add mid low switch here. So you can use the control key to move those elements here. Let's create a little bit of space. We'll move that down there and then we'll plug the add mid low into the color variation. So now the color var variation is happening after the blending of all the layers, but it is happening before the addition of snow. Or if we have the snow switched off, it will still go through the um, regular false path here. And we just have to now connect the output here to our landscape layer blend. So if we save that, we come back. At the moment, I'm not seeing anything on here, but that may be because I didn't connect, reconnect something. Let's go back here and have a look. Oh yes, I see what I did. I forgot to connect something into the false pin of the add color variation switch here. So I need to take the output from the mid low, plug it into the false so that if there's no color variation, it just takes the uh, blend as it is. Now it should work, save it, come back here. And you can now see that we've got our overdone color mask below the snow, but nothing in the snow now. And now we can move our, put our intensity back down and the snow doesn't get affected. Let's look at the next question. There are two points to address in this comment from Elgin Zandera. Uh, first one, they say they were troubleshooting an issue where the points didn't seem to isolate to the mid low layer. Now, I've noticed as I've been going through these tutorials that the logic, if we go to our material landscape, this part of the material where we calculate our grass type and our physical materials is making some assumptions that each of these masks is higher than the mask below. So the mid high slope mask has to be greater than the mid low and the ground in order for these subtracts to work. If, for example, you make the mid high slope mask very low, then it will then exaggerate where the cliff is and the same with the other masks there. So it's fine for what we've been doing, but um, we need a better foliage mask. So we'll leave it as it is for now, but I will do an episode where we'll rebuild this so that it can cater for hiding the layers or even having the layers uh, below the others. Um, it seems to work differently as well between the landscape grass and the physical material. Um, the grasses allow you to have the overlapping components, which is fine. The physical material, because it exists on the landscape, there can only be one physical material below each point. So it does mean the behavior is different, uh, but it works for now. We'll address it in the future. Let's look at Elgin's second point. Um, they moved their PCG volume around the level and they noticed they had this PCG stamp actor that appeared in the level um, and they didn't know what it is. Uh, I told them they could delete it and everything would go back to normal. But let's um, look at what that actual, that actual PCG stamp is because it is quite useful to be able to do this. Let's go back to the level here and you can see that we're using 
PCG to generate these grass clumps here at the moment. And as we saw, PCG can get quite expensive to regenerate, especially if you've got a lot, lot of logic in your graph for calculating the points and exclusions across the whole landscape. So if you select the PCG volume, and let me just drag this out a bit, you can see that there are three main options. We've been using cleanup, which stops the PCG from generating temporarily. So while we're painting on our landscape, it's useful to not having the, having the PCG spawning uh, reoccurring time and time again. Once we want to generate the PCG again, we can click on generate. And after a few seconds of doing all the PCG tasks, our grass clumps should reappear on the landscape. And there they are back again. But if, we, if we're happy with this and we're not likely to change it in the future, there's this third option, clear PCG link. It's not a great name for the button. What it actually does is it keeps this grass as it is, but it clears the link between this spawn grass and the PCG graph. So if you click on that, what you'll notice is now this PCG stamp has appeared. And that PCG stamp is what holds all of these instanced static meshes for the, for the landscape. And now if we wanted to, we could deactivate our PCG volume or disable it and the grass would still be there. So this is a, a static actor now and it's not dynamically changing. We can still go back to the PCG volume though. So we could just simply delete that PCG stamp and now the grass is gone, then we'd have to go back to the PCG volume and we'd have to do a generate again. And you can see the grass is back and now we've got a dynamic PCG graph again. So use that clear PCG link uh, when you're happy with the PCG volume and you don't want to do recalculation every time you change something. Again, on the subject of PCG, John Fuchsia, hope I've pronounced that correctly, says I can't get the unbounded PCG generation to work. It crashes every time I try to generate. My map is fairly big, but I don't see why that should be an issue with culling. Well, the reason why the culling doesn't make a difference is because the culling only happens when after the meshes have been generated. So that's really a runtime uh, save on performance in showing these in when we're generating the PCG graph if I go to the graph that we've got in place this is generating all of the points on the landscape and you can kind of see this is a 2k landscape but if you go to a 4k landscape it's um, it's not um, twice the size of points because it's in two dimensions it's four times the size so if you look at the inspection on our surface sampler for the getting the points before we filter by mid low layer we did it depending on the density we got 60 you can see the number of points here 63,504 points and then I added this surface sampler here for excluding the path and because I did very dense points because I really wanted to make sure the no grass is on the points and let's inspect this and you can see this is actually 1 million points now so you really need to think about how you optimize these graphs. Maybe I should have, um, after the surface sampler here, maybe I should have filtered by the path as well. But I probably wouldn't have got rid of every grass on the path because I didn't have it as densely populated. So you really have to think about those things. But as a strategy, um, I've already said that st start with an area uh, in the PCG volume and have these unbounded just to test things out. And then when you're ready to test it across the landscape, save everything, do the pause regen here so that it doesn't accidentally regenerate the graph when you do something. And then what I would suggest is that in your surface sampler, you start to have a large number of points per square meter to start off with. So put that up to a high value and then just test that it works in principle across the landscape. And then you can start to reduce this points per square meter. But you're going to need a powerful machine if you've got a large landscape. And you'll notice if you look at your uh, performance task meter on your PC when you're doing this, 
that it's pretty memory intensive as well. I've got 32 meg in this PC, which I would say is a minimum for working with Unreal Engine anyway. But if you've got more, that might even be better for large landscapes. Andy Seabrook says, I was really hoping to watch this playlist back to back, but the order is back to front. Uh, that was my mistake. I didn't check that out. As I published each video, it was putting the new videos at the front of the playlist. So I've just gone and changed the order. So it's in the published order. And you can see now this is the playlist starting off with the introduction and going through everything in order. And hopefully as I add new videos, including this one, they will go at the end of the playlist. So sorry about that, Andy, but uh, it's been fixed now. Here's a comment from Mad Warbit about the foliage mask we're using. So we had those two types using landscape grass types and the physical materials for PCG. Uh, they've made the point that if you create a new level in your project and a new material instance, it will still be using the same landscape grass types and uh, physical materials. That means that the foliage will be the same across both levels. So um, let's look at that in detail and discuss that. If you look at the material landscape, we are right into the grass types and the grass types are set in stone. You can't change these in parameters, which is annoying. Um, but yes, it does mean that if you set up, for example, a grass type for mid-low, then even if you set up a new level uh, with the grass in a different place, it will still, because that grass type defines the meshes that are spawned, it will um, be the same on each level. However, if you have a new project, uh, you have a single level in your um, game or, or cinematic, and then you open up a new project and you set up this, you can have different grass types in your new project. So it's only an issue when you're having multiple levels in the same project. Now, the physical material isn't quite as problematic because we're writing to the physical material on the landscape, but we're not specifying the procedural content generation that's happening against that physical material. That is defined in the level. So if you want um, grass to be different in each level, then use the PCG approach. And that way you can have different fo foliage spawning for different levels. If you want different levels, but with the same broad brush strokes for the foliage or meshes that you're putting at different levels, then you can use landscape grass. And as I've shown you before, you can mix and match these. So there should be a solution for um, the issues that you face. Landscape grass types are quick and dirty to set up. The reason why I showed them first and I'll also show them in the next video when I do the island and ocean level. The reason I use this is because they're quick. Um, they only do one thing and they spawn grass at a certain density. So they don't have the overhead that PCG has. But with that uh, simplicity and speed comes a lack of flexibility. So that's when we move to PCG. So I hope that's answered your question. Uh, a couple of people, as I said, talked about that. And uh, We'll move on to the next one. OK, three comments for the price of one in this one. This is all to do with the RVT episode. So the point was made in the first couple of comments about how we could improve, say, the blending with something called normal masking. And the second comment talked about how you could do distance blending for the RVT. Now, I do know how to do these. It's just that the RVT episode was about an hour long. So I will do an RVT part two episode well, yes, we will do distance blending on the runtime virtual texture. And yes, we will do a normal mask and better blending. A uh, third comment here, though, uh, was something that was a slip of the keyboard on my part. They said if, that when they looked at the cube with the RVT blending applied, it was much lighter than the original background. So the blending didn't really look accurate. And this was a simple error on my part. So let me show you uh, what I did by mistake. And then you can fix that if you want in your example cube. So coming back here, if I select the cube, focus in on it. So this is the point that you can see that we've got this blending here 
but it's very light. In fact, the tiling's wrong as well. So if I go to the, because we haven't done distance blending yet, it's using the far tiling. So let me change the far tiling size in my material instance to match my near tiling size. And let's also, we'll need to up the blend distance as well. So let's find the material instance for this cube. So I'll go into the material, go into the material instance, and in our RVT blending, I'm going to put the blending distance way up. Okay, so now this is um, fully blended here, but you can see it's still substantially lighter than the ground underneath. And that's because, as I said, I made this uh, simple slip up. If I go into the um, cube, the, the master material, M cube, you can see that in my material, I set the specular to one. I meant to set it to zero. So it has no uh, reflectivity at all now with zero. So if I save that back, you can see now it is the same color as the element underneath. And I've rotated it round as well so you can see better situation so we've still got the issue of it being stretch lines on the side but if I put it upright like that you can see as I move away then you can see that is virtually blended with the ground underneath so going back to the first two comments yes the blending could be better the distance blending could be better and we will do that in an RVT part two episode shortly so I hope you found it useful seeing some of the viewers' comments and how we would address those issues. And you've also seen that there's going to be two or three episodes coming up where we're going to do some refinements to our material. So stay tuned for those and I will see you in the next one. Bye for now.